Hello everyone! In case you're new to this channel, my name is Jelly and I'm just an average girl with average fitness. My friends and I climbed Mount Kinabalu on 25th and 26th March and here's how it went. In the last vlog, <laughs> After a very cold night with little sleep, we woke up at about 1.45am so that we could have our breakfast before the summit climb. It's the morning of the summit! Because it was so early, we did not have much appetite, but getting some carbohydrates into our bodies is a must, considering that the summit hike up and down would take at least 5 hours. How do you feel? This is me. Okay. Elena is in the toilet and we are waiting for her. We started the climb in the dark around 2.30 in the morning, struggled with thin air and steep 80 degrees vertical rocks where we had to crawl on all fours and pull ourselves up using ropes. We finally arrived at Sayat Sayat checkpoint. This is a crucial checkpoint to pass. In order to ensure that you'll receive the climbing certificate at the end of the trip, you have to show your climbing permit to the park officer. We don't have much footage of many sections of the trail while we were submitting because we were ensuring our personal safety above anything else. After passing the checkpoint, there was still about 1km of darkness, rocks and strong winds to go through. We are almost 1km away from the summit and it's getting chilly. It's just a lot of flat rock surface to climb. My muscles are burning. But we will get there. So. And it's cold. I need to pace myself because I'll get a headache if I don't. 5 plus am now. I'm trying to make it for sunrise. We joined the queue to take photos at the summit signboard and a few seconds to enjoy the view. The queue at the summit point was really long and very crowded. We're here. Say hi guys. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, we need to go. We need to go, we're late. That there is the summit pond. So you see, there's a reflection in the pond. This was what we climbed in the morning. Now we can see everything. Oh, my hair is a mess. Then we are going down. So we just left the accommodation. We are gonna go down to the base. We're still walking down three kilometers. Two more, two more hours. While we were descending, it started drizzling and then it turned into a full on storm as we climbed down from Panalaban Base Camp. The trails became slippery, wet, and muddy. We had to be careful in order not to slip, fall, and injure ourselves. About 5 pm, we were a few meters away from Timpohon Gate. These last few meters were possibly the most dreadful, in my opinion. My muscles were burning, I was soaked through and extremely exhausted with lack of sleep and non-stop hiking since 2.30 in the morning. I've never felt happier to pass through the gates and get back to flat ground. Now that we have successfully conquered Mount Kinabalu, I thought that we could help to answer a few questions based off our personal experiences. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully this will help you out if you are planning to climb Mount Kinabalu in the near future. 
So the first question, what is the most appropriate climbing attire for Mount Kinabalu? This answer probably varies from person to person. For me, I had on a tank top as well as sports leggings, two pairs of very thick socks as well as hiking boots. On top of this, I wore knee guards to protect the knees while you're climbing. And to prepare for the rain and cold, I had on a rainproof windbreaker. Yeah, and to add on to that, actually it also depends on individual's tolerance to cold. For myself, actually I just wore a t-shirt and long pants for the climb up because it can get really hot and you perspire really a lot while you're climbing upwards. Question 2. How much water should you bring for the climb up to Mount Kinabalu? Again, this very much depends on yourself. Personally, I found that drinking water helps keep altitude sickness at bay. In my bag, I carried up one 1.5 liters bottle as well as two 500 ml bottle. So in total, that is 2.5 liters of water. So on top of that, for the packed lunch that the package consists of, it also gives you another 500 ml bottle. So in total, you will have three 500 ml bottles on you. There's actually a water dispenser at the top of Panalaban. Instead of a plastic bottle, bring along a thermal flask, top up with hot water, which will be very helpful because it's very cold at Panalaban Hostel. Another tip for some other climbers is that instead of using water bottles, you can actually use water bags, which our friends Andy and Elena did. They filled out the water bags and placed it into their backpacks and they could drink from the drinking tube as they were climbing and walking instead of stopping, unzipping your bag, taking out the bottles and drinking. You see? Uh, okay, let me try. It's like diary. Mm. <laughs> okay. But personally, I found the water bottle method more effective because it actually forces me to stop, rest, take breaths, and then drink water and continue on rather than continuing walking while drinking, which doesn't really give me time to rest. Yeah. Question number three What should we be packing when we are climbing Mount Kinabalu? Just for context, we did not hire a portal to carry our bags ourselves up and down the climb of the mountain. Oh, why are you finding it? So we need to pack our bags because our shoulders were carrying all the weight. Here's a list of what we brought individually to climb Mount Kinabalu. So in general, what you should be thinking of is that when you're climbing, it can get really hot but you also got to pack for unpredictable rainy conditions. Things like disposable ponchos you can consider. Once we reach Panalaban Hostel, the weather is cool. It's around 8 degrees thereabouts and it will be even colder all the way up to the summit with howling winds and freezing conditions. Because you can't really predict when it will start raining, it will be good to pack your poncho or your raincoat right at the top of your bag or at the side of your bag where it's easy to just retrieve so you don't have to dig all the way down to the the bottom of your bag to get it out and wear it when it's already raining. One of the post-climb regrets I had was not packing in my insulated layer. I thought that a usual rainproof, windproof jacket would be sufficient but actually the insulated layer helps a lot when it gets really cold at night and you're trying to sleep but you can't sleep because it's too cold. So that's one regret I had from the whole packing list that you saw. Question 4. How long did we take to climb Mount Kinabalu and how fast you should be climbing? So in general, a person with moderate fitness and some training pre-climb should take about 6 hours hours to climb from Tinfohon Gate all the way up to Panalaban Hostel which is a 6km climb. From Panalaban Hostel on the second day, climb up to the summit, it's about 3 hours one way. And from the summit, when you come back down to Panalaban, the descent should take around 2 hours. And from Panalaban Hostel back down to Tinfohon Gate, it should take around 4-6 to six hours depending on your pain levels. Keep in mind that progressively you'll become more and more exhausted because you'll be exerting a lot of energy as you climb. Your knees will be in pain, your back will be in pain. Many people will just think I want to do the climb as fast as possible but but do view on the side of caution because Mount Kambalu is very high so the faster you climb, the higher the chances that you will get altitude sickness because you do not take enough time to rest, to acclimatize and it really helps when you have a heart rate monitor or a fitness watch strapped onto you so you can make sure that you do not go into the super high anaerobic zone which is quite dangerous especially at high altitude. There are all these guidelines on timing wise, it's really a general guideline. You should climb the mountain based on your own personal abilities. If you feel like you need to stop, stop. Just go at a constant pace. My left hand started tingling at the 4km mark onwards until I reached the summit. So I'm not sure if that's a symptom of taking altitude medication which we'll cover in the next question or is it because part of altitude sickness? Question number 5. Hiking sticks, yes or no? 
Personally, 6 kilometers up to Panalaban, I did not use hiking stick. For the summit climb, the following morning, I did use hiking stick. But there are certain parts of the summit climb trail that does not allow you to use hiking sticks because you have to use your all hands. your hands and your limbs. It's a bit like rock climbing. So you have to be on all fours to pull on the rope, pull your whole body up and things like that. So you have to keep your hiking stick for that part. For the descent from the summit all the way to Panalaban and from Panalaban back to Timpohong Gate, I used the hiking stick because my knees were really hurting and it helped to minimize the impact on my knees. We rented our hiking stick there because we didn't want to carry on on our flight. So we rented the hiking pole for 10 ringgit for one stick. But we also got to keep in mind that if you rent one pole, you have to carry that pole up to Panalaban Hostel. So it's extra weight. If you have knee issues, it might also be better if you use two hiking poles on your way down because the more contact point you have with the ground, it will actually mitigate the impact you have on your knees. So technically it will be better. Question number six, should we take medication for LD? The answer is yes, both of us did, including our friends Andy and Elwina. All four of us took this altitude sickness medication called Diamox. For Singaporeans, this medication actually requires doctor's prescription, but I believe in other countries you can get it from the pharmacies easily. To take Diamox, you need to start at least 24 hours before your climb, and throughout the entire climb, you have to continue taking Diamox as well. Twice a day, so that's 12 hours, one dose. Each Diamox pill is about 250 milligrams. Depending on yourself, you can eat half of it, 125 milligrams before the climb and it's good enough because Diamox also comes with various side effects. Other medications that I took include Panadol and that was because at Panalaban Base Camp, I developed a slight headache which was very uncomfortable and I decided to take one dose of Panadol to help me sleep better. But if you're looking at natural remedies for altitude sickness, there are other options that you can easily google online and one of it is to keep drinking water. The second thing is also to take as much carbs, carbohydrates as possible. I'm not very sure what's the science behind that but apparently taking carbohydrates help to reduce the headaches, the nausea and you will get your fair share of carbohydrates at the Laban Rata yes. guest house uh, restaurant where you get your buffet lunch. Options such as pasta, noodles, rice. Just a word of caution also, try to eat slowly. Don't gobble your food because the faster you eat, the higher the chances of getting indigestion and again you get nausea from indigestion so Question 7. Is there any difference in climbing certificates issue? Yes, there is! So in total, there are 5 different kinds of certificates. The first one will be just a general visitor certificate that you can buy at your own expenses when you visit Kinabalu Park. The other two will be a black and white version and a colour version. So this is dependent on whether you can reach Saya Saya checkpoint at the cutoff time of 5.30am. And if you can, you will get the coloured certificate. If not, you will just get a black and white certificate. And of course, for Ferrata climbers like Andy, there are 2 different routes that you can do for Ferrata. If you just choose the normal walk the talk route, you get a walk the talk certificate. And if you do the low peaks circuit, which is the longer and more challenging one, then you will get the low peaks circuit. Question 8. What is the best way to make sure that your hiking boots fit your feet well? When we first started our pre-climb training, we did just general double lacing, double knots, and we thought that it was sufficient. One of the things that was suggested by our subscriber is a boot lacing technique called the surgeon lace knot, and it really helped to secure your foot a lot better than just a normal double knot lace. Really gotta thank our subscriber, Moigo, who gave us this tip. Question number 9. What happens if anyone falls and hurt themselves during mid-climb? What happens if you become unable to walk? Just as how you pay for portal service to carry your bags up and down the mountain. Similarly, you can also pay for someone to carry you down the mountain. The price of this is slightly different from that of carrying your bags. This special portal service, whereby the portal piggy bags you back down to the base or the end point of Timpohon Gate. One kilometer at 620 ringgit. So this means that if you fall at the 3km mark, so you are 3km away from Timpohong Gate, that means you have to pay 3 times 620 ringgit. This cash payment can be made upon arriving at Timpohong Gate to the portal who actually carried you. So in case you're wondering, we actually saw two of such climbers being piggybacked back down. It is no laughing matter because when you hurt yourself, you really need a service. And kudos to the porters as well because I cannot imagine carrying someone and it's for hours on end down slope. It is a very dangerous job and kudos to them for taking it up. Question number 10. Did our mountain guide help as we climbed? Unfortunately for us, our group, the guide did not help us at all. Not physically or emotionally. 
he will be near us but he will be chit chatting with his other local guide friends who are nearby as well. At difficult parts of the trail, he also did not lend us any helping hand or instruct us which is the best way to climb up and down or maneuver around the boulders. On the side, we did notice other mountain guides helping other groups doing these things. He was not helpful, he was not very engaging, he was not encouraging and nor was he very patient. He actually kept chasing us to go on climbing, keep on moving when we were resting and catching our breaths. So that was quite irritating for me. He's going like, let's go, let's go, let's move. Towards the summit, he started to offer to help us take more photos with the intention of eventually getting tipped. He actually openly asked for $100 ringgit tip. The guide actually came along with the package itself and under the package is stated as an English speaking guide. So while he is able to mouth a few words of English, he's not exactly engaging in conversations. But we did eventually tip him and also pay him overtime charges because we came back down late. We felt that he could have been a bit more helpful along the way. It may be a good point to note when you are booking your trip with the operator to say that you want a English speaking guide. I guess we don't get to choose our guides. We don't. So hopefully you have better luck than we do. <laughs> but we still enjoyed the climb. Yeah, we enjoyed the climb. Alright, so in conclusion, we hope that us answering these questions actually helped you plan your Kinabalu trip. All in all, we really enjoyed the climb and it was an amazing time we had. It was painful, it was brutal, it was harsh, but at the end of the suffering, we were greeted with beautiful views, majestic mountains, majestic peaks, and an experience that I think we will not forget anytime soon. But we did not manage to spend a lot of time admiring the view though. Yeah, we're good. But nonetheless, if you have any other questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section down below. Or if you have similar experiences or very different experiences climbing Mount Kinabalu, please share them with us. We really want to hear all your stories as well. And lastly, remember to like, like share, share and subscribe. subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. Bye! Bye. You say that good things take time.